our topic is meningitis. So before we talk exactly about what meningitis is, we need to talk about what the meninges are, okay? So this little diagram here, the black here is your skull, okay? So this is actually the bone in your skull, and below your skull, you have three different layers. You probably remember this from anatomy physiology, but the three layers that you have before you actually get to brain tissue are gonna be your dura mater, your arachnoid, and your pia mater, okay? Dura mater, it actually means tough mother. Um, and the dura mater is the first layer just right below the skull. Below that, you have your arachnoid space, and the arachnoid space is very web-like, um, and just below that, you have your pia mater. And the pia mater actually kind of envelops the brain tissue and it hooks onto it very tight, while these other two are much more loose and there's much more space between there. But those three layers are called the meninges, okay? So we have our, our skull, below that we have our dura, arachnoid, and pia. And those three layers together are referred to collectively as the meninges. So what happens with uh, meningitis is it's actually, it's actually uh, an acute inflammation of these meninges. One of these areas or all of these areas or multiple parts of these areas can become inflamed. And that can be due to a few different things. Um, the main causes are going to be bacteria, virus, um, and then drugs. Different drugs that we give people or different drugs that people can take can actually lead to meningitis. So those are the main kind of three causes of meningitis. The things that will need to mostly be concerned about as nurses are kind of what are the signs and symptoms of meningitis and how can we recognize it in the patient. To do that, we do have a couple different mnemonics, but let's first just talk about some of the signs that you're going to see in your patient. First of all, the biggest thing is going to be a headache. The patient, as this, as this tissue or as this space here begins to become inflamed, it's going to start taking up more and more space, so the patient's going to have a headache, okay? And as it does that, it's going to start compressing um, blood vessels that are in this area, and as that happens, it's going to cause more pain, and it's going to lead to different neurological symptoms. The, the other thing that most patients are going to experience is neck stiffness. That's something that is, is seen in about 70% or so of patients that come in with meningitis is neck stiffness. Okay, so they'll have a really hard time bending their neck, and it's really going to hurt them. And like I said, that's seen in about 70% of people. Another thing is a very severe and sudden fever. They're going to get a quick fever. Um, another thing would be confusion, altered mental status, and photophobia. And those things are all going to be kind of signs of this cranial nerve palsy. As, as this tissue, as this space begins to inflame, you're going to see symptoms of the cerebral nerves being affected. Okay, so you're gonna get that altered mental status, you're gonna get confusion, you're gonna get photophobia, which basically means the patient's not going to want to be in bright light. They're gonna have a hard time being around light. So the, the ones that I would keep in mind for NCLEX and for your studies are gonna be uh, neck stiffness and altered mental status, okay? Now for the physician to diagnose this, there's a couple things that they can do to diagnose this. The best thing that they're gonna do and the most definitive thing they're gonna do is they're gonna do what's called a lumbar puncture. Okay, and you maybe have seen a lumbar puncture done or you may be taking care of a patient who's had a lumbar puncture. But basically what a lumbar puncture is, is they actually go into the back. And they'll actually go in and, and down a little bit lower in the back. And they'll actually go in right to the spinal column. And what they're going to take from there is they're going to take CSF. You know, CSF drains in the head and then it goes down throughout the spine. And so they'll go in there with a the spinal tap or lumbar puncture. And they'll go right into that lumbar space and they'll pull out uh, a little bit of CSF. Now the things that they're, they're going to look for in that CSF to help them diagnose meningitis are, so let's say CSF changes. 
So here's the, the CSF changes that they're specifically looking for are going to be low glucose. Okay, they're also going to be looking for increased WBCs. And then they're also going to be looking for increased protein. Okay, and what they might notice is that the CSF itself is actually cloudy. Okay, it's going to be cloudy or pink. Um, but, but specifically, they're going to pull the CSF and they're going to run it to the lab. What the lab's going to tell us is that the glucose is down, white blood cells are up, and protein is up. Those signs together are going to help diagnose meningitis. Okay? So those are the kind of the three key things they're going to look for that. Other things they're going to look for are just um, general lab changes if white counts up, and they're going to use these other diagnostic things to kind of determine that. And then they'll do scans and things to see if there is any sort of edema or swelling within the brain as well. Some of the biggest complications you're going to want to keep in mind with your patient, okay? So that's diagnosis, CSF changes, the lumbar puncture. Some of the biggest uh, complications you're going to look for in your patient, the number one complication you're going to be wanting to watch out for is going to be brain swelling and herniation, okay? So let's say complications. Okay, so the number one complication is going to be herniation. Okay, what is herniation? Well, what happens with herniation is this tissue begins to swell. There's only so much space in the skull for the actual brain tissue. And as this tissue begins to swell, it has to go somewhere. So at the base of our skull, we have, so let's say this is like looking in on a skull on the base of our skull, you know, where our, our brain stem comes out. We have this big hole here called the foramen magnum. Okay, and what can happen is, is as this as these meninges swell and swell and swell, the brain can only take up so much more space. There's not a lot of space within the skull, it's a very tight area. And so what can happen is the brain tissue can actually push out of this hole here. And if that happens, that can actually lead to brain death. So we're gonna to wanna to watch our patients for neuro changes. That's going to be the best way that we can monitor for this happening. Pupillaries becoming, pupils becoming fixed um, and dilated, um, any sorts of sudden neuro changes. But so we could we could talk about this much longer. Um, but the, the things you're really going to be looking for here are Cushing's triad. No, I'm not talking about Cushing's disease or anything like that. I'm talking about something different called Cushing's triad. If you want to say that a little bit more, that's a very fascinating disease, but it has to do directly with this brain herniation and kind of the symptoms that you're going to look for with that. But basically look for your neuro changes, and then there's some vital sign things you can look for as well. Other things we're going to want to watch for are sepsis and SIRS, systemic um, inflammatory response syndrome. So if this is the result of a bacterial infection, if that bacterial infection becomes um, severe, that can eventually lead to sepsis, septic shock, the vessels becoming massively dilated, and our patients not becoming perfused, and SIRS. So we'd want to watch our patients for that. Um, and then you can also have seizures. Um, what can happen is as this, as this is right in connection with the brain tissue, like I said, right here. So right here is going to be our brain. And as this, in, as this inflammation occurs, as that infection occurs, if it comes in contact with that brain tissue, as that brain tissue becomes irritated, we can have seizures. So you probably want your patient to be on seizure precautions in the acute period. You'd want to be monitoring temperatures, blood pressures, white blood counts, um, possibly um, volume status and things like that. And we want to be doing frequent neuro checks on your patients. So those are really the three complications that I would look at most with my patients if I had a patient who was coming in with um, meningitis. Okay, so let's talk about mortality really quick. You mo most likely will not get any questions on mortality, but we can talk about it really quick. So in 2013, there were about 300,000 deaths from meningitis. Okay, so not the most deadly disease, but it's definitely still something that we need to be concerned about. Um, untreated bacterial meningitis is almost 100% fatal. So 
you're going to have higher mortality with bacterial than you will with viral. Viral will actually um, resolve on its own almost um, for sure, but bacterial equals fatal if not treated. So the patient needs to come in, they need to get on antibiotics, they need to be getting these tests run, they need to be getting the spinal taps done um, to see how the disease is progressing and to be treated in a, in a very um, adequate, we'll say, neurological form. Okay. Overall mortality is about 19 to 35%. So the patient comes in, bacterial meningitis, hopefully the family catches these neuro changes, catches the patient is is acting a little bit different. They can bring them in before the disease progresses too much. We can get them on the antibiotics and we can uh, treat this bacteria. If it's viral, it should, uh, it, it may start to resolve on its own. Okay, so really quickly, let's just talk about some mnemonics to help you remember some of these things that we've talked about with meningitis. The first mnemonic is gonna be some of the, um, the complications associated with meningitis. And that mnemonic is just ABCDE cross. A, B, C, D, E, cross. Okay, so the mnemonic for that is A, B, C, D, E, ataxia, blindness, cranial nerve palsy, deafness, epilepsy. Again, these are the complications Okay, so meningitis complications, A, B, C, D, E, cross. Ataxia, what ataxia means is it really is a lack of coordinated movement. So the patient's not gonna be able to be, uh, to be coordinated as much as they, as they would be. So you might notice that in your patient. Blindness, again, as this begins to compress that area in the brain, as you begin to irritate those cranial nerves and compress those, we may develop, and this kind of goes along with this, cranial nerve palsy. We may develop blindness, cranial nerve palsy, um, optic nerve atrophy. You also might notice deafness in your patient or a hard time hearing. And then epilepsy can also be associated with a complication of meningitis. A couple others are cerebral herniation. We talked about that. Repeat episodes. The patient um, may have more more uh, episodes of, of um, meningitis after one stroke. So as this begins to compress those vessels in the brain, it can actually lead to an ischemic uh, attack in the brain um, as blood flow is cut off to uh, important areas of the brain. Because blood vessels are going to pass through the pia mater here. Um, and if those become compressed, then you're cutting off blood flow to your brain, and that's going to be a stroke. Okay? Uh, and then spastic paralysis. Some of the meningeal symptoms. Increased ICP, we talked about that with its swelling. You're going to run out of space in there, and your intracranial pressures are going to climb. Septic symptoms, fever, tachycardia. Spinal fluid changes, we talked about... Um, low glucose, high white blood cells, and increased protein in the, in the CSF, okay? Okay. Um, then there's these things called <coughs> Kerning sign and Brudinsky sign. What Kerning sign is, is you're actually going to kind of, you're gonna have the patient lying down, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna lift their leg up, and you're gonna to try to straighten your leg out. And they're gonna have a, a severe amount of stiffness here in the leg. And so they won't really be able to straighten that leg out. So kerning sign, knee bending, okay? So some of these meningeal symptoms are gonna be miss, KK, BBBB. Okay, miss, KK, BBBB. So kerning sign, you can remember that with the other K, knee bending. Kerning sign, knee bending. And then Brudinsky sign, think BBBB. Okay, Brudinsky sign is going to be as you so the patient's lying down here. What'll happen is you lift their neck up. You actually manually lift their, lift their neck right here. And as you do that, they're gonna flex at the hip and they're gonna bend their knees up, okay? And that's gonna be Brudinsky's sign. So bend the neck, back rigid, both legs flex. Okay, Brudinsky sign, BBB. Brudinsky sign, bend the neck, back rigid, both legs flex, okay? So meningeal symptoms, Miss, ICP increase, septic symptoms, spinal fluid changes. Kerning sign, knee bending. Okay, kerning sign again. You bend the, you straight, pull the leg up, knee's gonna bend. Brudinsky sign, bend the neck, back rigid, both legs flex. 
Okay? So that is the basics of meningitis. I hope that helps. Um, if you want to download kind of some of the notes with this, if you head over to nrsng.com slash meningitis, I'll put all the notes up there where you can kind of just see kind of the, the walkthrough of what we did here. If you have any questions, you can reach me. Contact at nrsng.com. I'd love to hear from you. Also, be sure, you guys, that you head over to, to rncrush.com. We did our app that is actually a mobile game that you can use to um, play for Inflex, play through four different game modes. It's a lot of fun. You can also head over to simclex.com. We're coming out with that very soon. Right now it is uh, March 2015. You head over to simplex.com. It is a fully adapted Inflex preparation program. First of its kind. It's going to be incredible. So make sure you head over there. Um, you can always check out our books too. Head over to nursingstudentbooks.com. I know that's a lot of websites, but if you check down below in the description, I have all those websites listed for you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for checking us out. You're going to do great. Nursing is hard, but you can do it, okay? Thank you so much, and happy nursing.